Welcome to Anton Teaches Packy AI. This is an experiment that we're running. I guess it was two weeks ago at this point, I tweeted some meme of Tim Cook looking at a chip uh, when he was on a tour of, of one of Apple's offices or factories or something, saying that this is me when I try to read an AI research paper. Anton replied saying that he'd be happy to do a weekly thing where he explains the papers to me. I feel very lucky to be in a position where smart people are willing to take the time. And we figured as we were talking back and forth, that there's probably a lot of questions that people have who are broadly interested in the space, but have no idea what's going on. They're just seeing all of this crazy stuff coming out. So we decided to just hit record on these conversations. I've never done video stuff before. I have a face for podcasts, but I think it's going to be fun to look through the papers as we go, put videos up. We're going to start with one paper today. I think over time, I'll have questions on particular papers. Would love to kind of hear what people who end up watching this want to dive into with you. But I don't know. I'm, I'm really excited. I think this is going to be fun to kind of nerd out and go deeper than I was hoping to be able to, to go in this world. Before we get started, big question is, Anton, who are you? How did you get to this <laughs> point where you're able to explain what's going on in these papers? Tell us about yourself. Yeah, sure. And you, and Packy's asking me, Anton, who are you? How did you get on my stream? Why is this happening? Yeah. Um, so I'm Anton. I'm the co-founder of a company called Chroma. We make machine learning tooling. And one of the things that we do is use model interpretability, which is understanding how the model actually does what it's doing to do things like automatically optimize your training data set from the day your model sees in production and lots of other cool things that we built on top of that. So I, I built this company or started building this company because of my last or seven or eight years of experience, especially in robotics, where I worked mostly on problems in what's called perception, which is about getting computers to understand the real world and what's going on in it. And usually in 3D and in, in very dynamic environments where there's people and things moving around. And, one of the critical tools in um, in making all of that work has been machine learning. From you know very early on in about 2004, we had the first real machine learning models deployed in the DARPA Grand Challenge, where we saw that okay, like you know, maybe the possibility of self-driving is now actually within reach, even though we haven't reached it yet. Maybe we're close. And I think especially over the last two years, there's just been almost a phase shift, like a huge change in the capabilities and features that machine learning has and the things that they can do. And as somebody who has a background in this stuff coming from, you know, computer science, applied mathematics, robotics, I've stayed on top of that research. And, and then now that I've founded Chroma, it's kind of my job to, to stay on it, know what's going on, understand the models that people are using and the new ones that are coming down the pipe. So that's, that's me by background. Yeah, it's cool. I worked at a startup before this, but not on, in a technical role, the startup did kind of in real estate. And I think most people will be more familiar with the part of the tech world where the things that we're interacting with aren't necessarily so clearly based on research papers, right? Like if you're mm -hmm. using a new B2B SaaS product, it's because somebody came up with a clever new workflow or something that annoyed them that they think like, oh yeah, all the, this off the shelf stuff can help solve. But mm -hmm. in you know, where I've spent a lot of the time over the past year or so in crypto, very white paper driven. And then mm -hmm. certainly AI ML seems to be very, very research paper driven where these papers come yeah. out and then it opens up this kind of whole new world of exploration for other people. So I think this is going to be a fascinating way to dive in and maybe even see the future a little bit on like, as these papers come out, cool. Like what can people do with these things? So we're going to start with yeah. a paper that's a bit more foundational, I think is about five years old. And so the things that are in the future from this one. I, I just want to interject. I love that this paper is now considered old. It's like this, this thing is from 2017. We're here in 2022 and in, in five years, this is now old, but it, it is really foundational. I'm glad we're starting with this one. Right. I mean, like hopefully with, when we start looking at the ones that are, that are coming out now, you can predict that in five years, we'll have things like GPT-3 and Stable Diffusion and whatever else that are based on on top of it. But I think like that's one of the cool things here is that if, you're, if we're understanding what's going on in the research papers, maybe you can understand what these models are going to be able to do a little bit better. Yeah. So we're well, going to start. It's this oh, interesting phenomenon. There's this interesting phenomenon as well, right? Where in a lot of ways, we're actually still exploring the possibilities of even the models we have today while new ones are still coming down the pipe. It's pretty incredible. Like people are doing more and more interesting things with GPT-3, even though that's probably about a year and a half old now, right? We've seen the step-by-step -step prompting. We've seen like the 
self-introspection stuff very recently and like the architecture hasn't changed it's just, it's literally like look at what this this new neat thing that this thing <laughs> exists can do and that's going to keep happening as well i think i think the value especially for people who are not necessarily in the technical depth or doing the research themselves to reading these papers and understanding them is at least getting a feel for where stuff might be coming from and get a taste with like what a given advance like where it fits into the entire landscape i think that's why this is kind of like cool and important you anticipated my first question, which we'll we'll get to in a second. And just so I can save face here, an audience note, I'm really dumb naturally, but also I'm going to intentionally ask dumb questions so that we can get to like the real basic understanding of what's going on. And then I'm sure as these go on, we'll build up from there. But I'm gonna I'm gonna be the the useful idiot here, which I think is a, a role that I was born to play. So when we when we were going back and forth on Twitter, you said to pick your favorite research paper. I said you pick. And then you picked this paper that I had heard of, I think first, I I'd maybe heard of it before, but like just that week had seen it in Ben Thompson's interview with Daniel Gross yeah. and, and Matt Friedman, and then was listening recently to the Lex Friedman podcast with Andre Kaparthi. And he mentioned mm -hmm. this paper, it seems to be kind of the, the foundational paper for everything that's going yeah. on now. Without further ado, I'm going to put it up on the screen. We're getting fancy with the video technology here. Let's go. Attention is all you need. So this paper came out, as I said, in, I think, December of 2017. I guess to start off, can you give an overview of the state of play before Attention yeah. is All You Need came out and kind of what the big shift was when the paper came out? Yeah, and I actually think that's probably the single most important thing about this paper is to understand it in context and what it really did and, and why it was such a huge event. So prior to Attention is All You Need, most of what was being done in text modeling and language modeling was the use of these recurrent networks. And the thing that a recurrent network does is you have to wait for, for it to output and then read that output back into itself so it can only do things sequentially. But a model based on attention alone allows you to do compute multiple parts of what you need for the model from the input sequence in parallel, which is, which is like a huge advance. And it also reduces, in some sense, the distance between like the effect a given token in the, in the input has to what the model's doing, which means it makes it easier for the model to learn those relationships as well. Those are the two big things. Before, before attention is, is all you need, like LSTMs were common, recurrent, various recurrent models were common, and now we have attention, and, and you know people think of it as, as this class of models called the transformers. It turns out that this works really, really well precisely because you can ingest like a wide amount of context in parallel and then train it in such a way that all of that context is, is like appropriately absorbed as opposed to being like really, really far away from where the training needs to happen con conceptually. Hopefully that makes some kind of sense. I'm also not above saying dumb or wrong things on this, <laughs> on this recording. So I'm sure that if I do say something wrong, people will correct me. Um, it's, the and, and the I, it's the beauty of the internet. My first question there, and something that I was wondering when I was reading through the paper, does parallelization let you do things that you couldn't have otherwise done? Or like given an, an infinite GPUs and infinite time, could a recurrent model have done something similar? This just helps it get done faster, cheaper than, you know, with recurrent models. So that's a really good question. I think generally speaking, the fact that it's parallel hides a bunch of other stuff, which was sort of discovered and, and like figured out later about this particular architecture. There's a great resource called, well, it's, it's not a resource, it's actually an entire research direction called Transformer Circuits from a company called Anthropic. It's run by Chris Ola and a few other people in this model interpretability space. I'll send you the link later on. But what they do is in, in that like line of research is break down like what the paths are, what the actual computational paths are through the model. And this paper also like alludes to the short the shortening of those computational paths. So besides making it more computationally efficient and besides actually like making it efficient enough to trade on like a vast corpus of data in like a human reasonable amount of time, shortening those paths by making them parallel instead of sequential means it trains better. Like it's better able to understand more context and better being better able to understand more context is like how language models have gotten so good lately. They're still not, you know, they're still not quite there, but they're, they're doing really, really well. And how does that 
how does that work? And that might be like an overly simple <laughs> end question, but like, how does it let them train better? Yeah. So if you, if you imagine like a, a recurrent model, right? The first tokens in the sequence, the model, are, the model is going to see them first and like respond to them. You can imagine like it's training, so it's going to respond to them. Um, Just to do like very, very, very basic. When we say token, we're not talking about crypto. We're not talking about Chuck E. Cheese. Yes. Like wh what is a token here? A token is usually a word in a string. So a token is usually a word, but it can also be certain characters. It can be like par parts of a word. You will see like tokenization where like even like apostrophes or commas, court marks are used as like almost as if they were their own word. It's, it's basically just how you break up a sequence of text cool. into, into pieces. Each piece of text is called a token. Cool. That makes sense. I'm sure someone has tried to like turn this into actual crypto tokens. I'm sure we'll see that start up very soon. Someone, someone is going to be like, what is the intersection of crypto and AI? They both have tokens and then somebody's going to start to do that. <laughs> I do. This is for a future conversation. I do have <laughs> thoughts on that intersection somewhat, but they're not fully formed enough for me to say, to say on this, on this exact Look, episode, but Nat Friedman has this great tweet, which I, which I keep quoting because the sentiment has like gone around lately with just how the environment is right now, which is like, AI is Ellis Island for crypto refugees. And like, <laughs> <laughs> it's such a good summary of what's, of a lot of what's happening right now. But yeah, I mean, that's, that's a different conversation. Yeah, no, I mean, I, I'm here having a conversation with you about AI after, after writing a lot about crypto. The charitable interpretation, which I'm going to give myself is that that was the most fascinating thing happening over the past couple of years. This is very clearly the most fascinating thing happening. Like if you're interested in just like, what is the weirdest, furthest out stuff that we can do on the internet? Those are the two answers for the past couple of years. And I hope that the weirdest furthest out in a little while is what happens when the two of them come together. But back to attention is all you need. So I interrupted sure. you to ask a dumb question about no, what tokens were, we were, we were going over, going over, I guess, why they're able to train better with parallelization. Yeah. That's right. That's right. And it's just that the paths from the feedback signal to the weights in the model are shorter in the parallel architecture than they are in an LSTM in a, in a recurrent model. And that means that like, again, conceptually, you can think of it as each part of the model because it's doing it in parallel rather than like this deep serial stack, it's more like a wide parallel stack. And again, th th these are gross simplifications about what's really going on. But conceptually what that means is the path from like the feedback signal to arrive at each part of the model is shorter than in the very deep recurrent setting. And so that means you learn better. It's well, like, it's sense. like, yeah, it's, I I'm trying to think of a good analogy. It's like, you know, it, Imagine, <laughs> that's a terrible analogy. I'm going to use that one. Give it, give it. I was like, imagine, imagine you're trying to reach across the room with like, you, you know, when you were a kid, you're like, have a tape measure or maybe you still do this. Actually, I still do this. You have like a tape measure and you like extend it. And then oh, if yeah. you extend it too far, it like falls down. But if you have like a bunch of tape measures of equal length, they won't fall down. It's not really like that, but it's fun to think about. It makes, it makes sense. It also brings to mind for me, like, I remember we had Ben Rollert, who I used to work with at Breather, who runs a company called Composer now. I remember he mm -hmm. just like as a toy model ran this thing where like he thought we were being too slow in the company. And so he was like, all right, what happens if like, you know, with uh, assuming that you make even just like 51% the right decision or, you know, 49, like what does it look like if you just make those decisions a whole hell of a lot faster? Like what happens to your company's growth trajectory? And like, if you're right more than you're wrong, you should make more decisions more quickly. And like, obviously, actually this brings up another question, like you need to weight things correctly, I guess, you know, the, not all decisions are created equal, but when you say that this learning then like weights the model, right. what's happening there? Right. So when we talk about model weights, they're like the parameters of the model itself. It's, it's basically numbers. Like the, the class in machine learning, right? You, you have the model weights, which are numbers that the model actually stores. They're part of the model itself. And then you've got another set of numbers, which represent the input. And we can talk about how words get turned into numbers in a little bit. You have numbers which represent the input and those numbers get multiplied together or like different things happen together. And so the weights stay the same, but for different inputs, multiplying by those weights are like functions of those weights multiplied by the inputs or whatever you like creates the output. So when I say model weights, it's like 
when a model gets trained, that model's weights are a full description of that model. That's, that's what I mean when I say weights. Yeah. And, and the things that impact those weights. So if, if GPT-3 trains on the whole mm -hmm. internet, mm -hmm. is it too simplistic to think about, like if it sees the same thing happening in a lot of different ways, in a lot of different places across the internet, then it gets, it, it weights those things proportionally more or what's the right way to think about not like, exactly what the weights? not exactly the, the the weights of the model are the things that get changed as the model trains so there's a thing there's a thing called a loss and a loss is basically just the difference between the output that you want and the output that a model is giving you right now and the basic algorithm of all machine learning models is you compute your loss which is some difference and there's like lots of ways to write down a loss, but just imagine it as the difference between what you have and what you want. And then you compute what's called a gradient. So a gradient is basically the derivative of the loss with respect to the weights. It's like, it's a calculus thing, but basically it says, okay, which direction do I need to turn each of the numbers that represent my network in order to get better at, in order to make that loss less and therefore get closer to what I actually wanted each time I make a prediction. That's the basic training algorithm of all machine learning models. And so, when you go out, like you have an internet's worth of, of text, right? And the model will see like similar words used in similar patterns that will help push the model's weights in the right direction. It's not so much that like seeing the same thing a lot makes it weighted more. That's not really the way to think about weights. It's more like seeing the same thing in different patterns makes the model figure out what it should predict when it sees those patterns in its input. Got it. Okay. That makes, yeah. that makes sense. And so in the paper, they talk about an English to German translation task. Yes. And is, yep. is the point of that, that you're like, you have this dictionary in front of you and you can say like, this is what I'm trying to get. I'm starting here. And so like, how do you minimize the loss or like, why are they testing on English to German? Yeah. So translation tasks are like a really classical application of what's called natural language processing. That's one of the like, natural language processing is probably one of the oldest fields in AI because it's one of the things that we wanted to figure out how do we do first. Machine translation was like of critical defense importance also for a long time. So back in like the fifties and even as early as the late forties, the government was pouring like tons and tons of money into research about this. And for the longest time we had, you know, expert systems where linguists and, and like human translators were like should sit down and try to encode all of the rules and language into these computer systems. And they never worked terribly well, right? And then for a long time, even, even like machine systems, they like kind of worked. They were like kind of okay. And the reason for that was they would lose context. So if, if you had like a long sentence, and if you said like, I'm trying to think of a good sentence, there are things called like Vinograd schemas, but there's like long sentences where it loses track of what the sentence is actually talking about. And that messes up the translation. And you can imagine how complex that gets when you have languages that are different to English. So for example, language, English doesn't have gendered nouns. German does. And not only does German have gendered nouns, German has five, five verb cases. I, I happen to know this because I, I speak German, but like it, it has all of these cases. And so even getting the rules of grammar for English and then into the rules of grammar for German to like have the same meaning is a very, very difficult task. It's like a classical problem in in AI overall and natural language processing in particular. So to throw this kind of a model at a translation task and have it work well is like a demonstration of the power of the model. It shows that like, yeah, this is actually really, really strong compared to our other efforts in being able to do this. This is just better. And that, yeah, I mean, the, the translation task is also something that you can test because in many places, especially on the web, you have identical pairs of text. Right. And that's one of the things that you really need for models like this. You need pairs of text, which are, and, and you can think of them today in terms of a prompt and a completion. So a prompt is your input, a completion is your output. And so it's easy to find pairs of text that are like, okay, English. And I want to, you know, my prompt is like this English text and my completion is this German text. And so that's, that's why I do the translation task. It's, it's an important task. If you can do it, it shows that your models perform really well. Makes sense. And, and it's like classically very hard. That makes, that makes a lot of sense. So I, another, I'm going to go almost back to the top with another sure. kind of just basic question. And it, I, maybe this makes sense. Maybe it doesn't, which is like, can you explain the hierarchy of the different, like kind of models in terms we're using here? Like 
you know, is the transformer architecture still like, is, is, are we still in the world of neural networks? Like where do yeah. LLMs fit into yeah. transformers? Like how does that whole thing look? Yeah, that's, that's actually a really good question for demystifying. And just before we got started with the recording, I was saying to you, basic questions like this are really good because if you're a person who's immersed in this, you just take it for granted, right? You can, you can mentally swap all the terms in your head, but if you're a new person and especially a non-technical person coming to this world, you're like, I don't, like, are these different? Are they the same? How do they fit together? So it's actually a really good question. So transformers are a architecture. They are a neural architecture. What a neural network actually is has evolved based almost out of all recognition since since the term was invented not quite but almost the term neural networks again was invented in in like probably i think the 50s or 60s i can't remember for sure but at the time there was this big idea like it was called the connectionist idea of of intelligence people had looked at the neurobiology of the brain they're like well it's actually all these little units they're like connected to each other and they seem to fire when like there's enough signal coming from different other places it's connected to when there's enough like voltage, it seems to fire. So let's make a computer that acts like that. And we'll call it a neural network. Right. And then very smart people were like, well, how do we get these neural networks to understand things? We'll train them, which is, you know, that algorithm that I described before, that's, yep. that actually wasn't the first algorithm either. It took a long time to figure out like, how do we actually train these things on something useful back propagation, which is like this which is the way everything is done now, was an original idea at a time. It was not at all obvious that that's what you should be doing. I'm going to ask you to describe backpropagation now. I mean, it was, it was exactly that algorithm that I just described. You take a look at the output, you take the difference between the output and the input, you use that to construct a gradient, and then you, use, you flow the gradients backwards through the model back to the output, adjusting the weights in the right direction along the way. Cool. That's, that's like the high-level overview of what it is. Anyway, so today, like... Those neural networks were very relatively simple. Actually, I, I don't know if you're familiar with like the AI winters. General idea of we get excited about something, yeah. it doesn't quite work, and then we have to like go back to the drawing board. And then funding gets pulled. Yeah, the, the first AI winter happened because somebody demonstrated that like in an extremely simple case, neural networks couldn't perform this like particular logic task. And then like for whatever reason, like the DOD was like, okay, we're going to pull funding from this. It can't do this simple thing after all this time. That's silly. When, when actually even that paper that got published, like they can't do this was like, no, 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 simple versions, simple ones can't do this. They, they were very explicit to mention, like the most simple ones can't do this, but everyone like blew it out of proportion. Cause I mean, at the time also, it wasn't really like, there wasn't these huge advances that people had assumed would come anyway. So neural networks, like that's what they used to be. They used to be this one very specific thing, but over time it's evolved into like a family of things. And, and I would say that like with today, like a neural network is, requires you to have a few things. It requires you to have connections, which have weights. It requires you to have non-linearities. So non-linearities are like, you have an input and the output, like it's a function where the output is not just the input times something plus something. It has to have some other function in between. That's like a very rough definition. Someone is going to yell at me that I missed a bunch of stuff. I don't care. I know I did. So basically anything that has those properties can fairly be called a neural network. Because that's, that's actually turns out what you need. You need connections, which have weights, and you need some nonlinearities between them. And it turns out as well that like, the, because that's all you need, it turns out that we can make like doing this stuff very computationally efficient because it comes down to like matrix multiplication and matrix multiplication is something that we know how to do really well on computers for, for lots of reasons. Anyway, so a transformer is a pretty like advanced and relatively complex form of neural network. Actually, in some ways, it's actually also very simple, which I know is a contradiction in terms, but maybe we'll get to that. And a transformer is a type of neural network. So to go to your other point about large language models, most large language models today use variants of the transformer architecture, this, which, which is like rooted in this paper that we're looking at attention is all you need. This is the fundamental architecture for most large models, large language models, at least today. There is a new class of models for image generation, which are like working really well, called you know, diffusion models. They are a little bit related in, in, in a very broad sense, but they're both neural networks. They're both large models. Transformers are mostly for tasks where you have a sequence of tokens, right? That's, you can, you can think of that. A large, a large, a large yeah. language model is just a model that deals with sequence of tokens. Transformers is usually the architecture that make language, large language models work. Something interesting as well, though, is like 
you shouldn't restrict your thinking about this just particular domain because there's a thing called an image transformer where they what they do is they take an image and they tokenize it. They cut it into little pieces and then they fit it into a transformer. And it turns out you can do image tasks with this thing that was originally meant for text. If you train it right and think about it. And that's kind of another thing that I was talking about earlier is like we're still exploring the capabilities of the models that we already have while continuing to innovate on the like algorithms and architectures. It's just a super exciting time to be in this field. Yeah. So the is a basic architecture. So I, I guess maybe the next place to go, there's a section, mm -hmm. maybe I'll scroll to it. Yeah, section cool. three talks about the model architecture here. Yep, here he is. So I guess one, can you explain kind of just what the model architecture looks like? It, it, here it is graphically. For those of us who like <laughs> might not be able to follow that, like what, what exactly is going on in here? And then yeah. how much has changed in that in the past five years, or if the, it's just what's being built on top of it that's that's changed so much? Yeah, so a lot of this, uh, I'm going to start with the second question first, and then we'll get into the diagram. A lot of what's been innovative lately is mostly about like making this more efficient and understanding what it's actually doing and testing it in different ways and putting different things inside it, basically. The core architecture is relatively unchanged. So what I'm, that's a good place to go into about what the core architecture actually is. Like, what is this diagram that I'm looking at, which is the real question you were asking. Basically, the core architecture in a transformer is this encoder-decoder pair. So an encoder, so the left side of this, what you're looking at, the left column basically is the encoder, and the right side is, is, is the decoder. Um, and so it's a good idea to probably talk about like what's actually being encoded. So what's being encoded on the left is the input sequence. So you have your, your prompt, it's getting encoded. It's getting encoded into first. So that pink box first at the bottom is, says input embedding. So that is a operation which transforms words into numbers, basically into vectors of numbers. So what that box will do is it will take your long string, that's your input, and transform it into a vector of numbers where each number represents a token. So that transformation is already learned. In this paper, it's already learned. You can also do it other ways. You could have like a fixed thing that does it, but here, here it's learned. And, and I think in most cases these days, the, the word embeddings are, are learned. There's this like another thing we can talk about, about like how the input embeddings actually, and you can do all kinds of neat tricks with them, but that's, that's the basic. So then and this, the this part bit. is when, like, if you're familiar with the GPT-3 playground screen, like the mm -hmm. regular text that I type at, at the top before you see all the green highlighted stuff below, that's yep. the input that we're talking about here. That's, that's right. That I'm writing. That's right. That's right. And then it gets turned into numbers, a vector of numbers. And then the next thing that happens here is a positional encoding. This is actually a really important thing. This was something that I think is actually a like pretty important to the history of these things because in a recurrent model, like an LSTM, you don't need the position encoding. The position encoding is like implicit because if you're on the nth step, you know you're talking about the nth position. Like if you're on oh, the yeah. nth step of the recurrence. Here, we've got the whole text at once. So we, like, we, need to, we need to know what part, like, what part of the text each word is actually in as opposed to treating it as like a collection of words, right? This is a problem yeah. that a lot of this is a problem that a lot of prior approaches in NLP had, where there was like there was not really like you, you just got like a bag of words and then and then the, the like machine translator would like try to reconstruct something from that bag of words. It doesn't really work. So you need the position encoding to keep the order so that the network knows about the order, the transformer knows about the order the words came in from from the input. And it, you know it, it's it's I, I won't go into the math. It's fairly straightforward. What it does is it creates another vector and then it attaches that vector. Like it, that plus sign there just means they, they literally just glue it, glue it together. Uh, this vector and then the position coding, glue it together, feed it to the next layer. All right, so here's question where it gets... Dumb question alert. Dumb question alert before you go. So does that positional encoding, like, does, is that part of the reason that it like has this concept of position that yes. like even long paragraphs feel yes. more cohesive than like the garbled ego yes. that came out before? Yes. Yep. So like it's this big, input, it's, it's like reason. requirement that it needs to like figure out yep. what's going on also actually yep. makes the output better. Yeah, exactly. I mean, like the thing that it needs to make the output better is to know what's going on. It's all about, it's all about context and it's all about like, I'll, I'll get to attention in a minute, but what attention does for us is every time you're trying to predict the next word, it knows where to go looking in the input to make the right prediction. 
So in that case, it like it, what you were saying about weights before is actually true. Attention weights the input appropriately in order to make a weighted prediction instead of a flat, equally distributed prediction. Cool. Uh, that's what attention does for us, right? Anyway, so we have the position encoding and now we get into the stack of, of encoder layers. So that gray box, there's actually, I think six of them in this paper's architecture. Other, other like six is actually kind of arbitrarily chosen. I think they actually chose it so that it like optimally fit in the GPU memory and like fully utilize the compute that they had. So first we have this thing called a multi-head attention mechanism. So attention, like I mentioned, it's like, it's this thing that allows you to weight your input appropriately for making a prediction. And a prediction here is literally like the inputs to attention are numbers and the outputs are also numbers, right? It like, it like looks, looks, looks at different parts of the context, weights them differently, does like a couple of matrix multiplies in a nonlinear piece, and then outputs something. And it, it's more complex than that. It's, you know, query key value stuff, but, you know, to get more detail on that, you can read the paper in depth. But the important thing is, is that's what an attention head does. It looks at how to weight the numbers together. Anyway, so that's what attention is doing for you. And then, you know, there's, you'll notice this, this other thing. So multi-head means there's a bunch of these things. It's not just one. Uh, if it was just one, it could only like, if, imagine if you could only pay attention to like one subject of a sentence in an entire paragraph, huh. even though there might be multiple subjects and they might be doing different things in different parts of the paragraph, right? So what the multi-attention head allows you to do is to weight things differently for different, different parts of the context. So you get richer and more information about, about that. And I think in this paper, they have, I just want to check how many attention heads they actually have. Here we go. It is in their architecture. Eight. So it has eight heads. Now, then it has this other thing where it says add and norm. So you see how there's like, that, that's multi-headed attention. That's what that guy's doing. And then it's got this add and norm thing. So what that allows you to do here is, okay, we're getting like these values out of the attention heads, but we also want to keep what we had originally, right? So, so that we can yeah. keep propagating that information as well. So it's like, the way to think about it is, is like, this layer has learned something, like it figured something out about this context, something important. Maybe it, maybe it figured out like the, like the big, maybe it like successfully broke it down into like important paragraphs or whatever. Well, that's not really what it's doing, but conceptually. But we want later layers of the network to also have information about what we started with. So they can be like, oh yeah, like we broke it down and here's what's in there. So like, I'm going to figure out more stuff about it. So that's what this bypass and then this add a norm is. So is it both building off of what happened when it figured out, you know, what the different paragraphs are or whatever, yep. and going back to just the original as well at yeah. the same time to make its own connections and then maybe somehow comparing yep. those things? Yep. It's keeping information about both. What actually blows my mind about this is the way that it combines them is an addition and then a norm. A norm is, is, is basically just constraining like the values that can be in the vector to, hmm. to be smaller than a certain amount. What blows my mind is addition when you think about it. Like it's a, it's a information destroying operation. So what I mean by that is like, if I have the number five, I don't know if you added one and four to get it, or if you added three and two, right? Yeah. I, I, don't, I, I can't know, but it turns out that this is enough to propagate information deeply into the network to, to just do that addition with the original input. It, it blows my mind that this works. It, it freaks me out every time I remember this. <laughs> I hate it, but it works. Wait, is it's there, is there like a best explanation for why it works? It, probably the best explanation is it preserves enough information. Like it, it propagates enough information. Like one way you could do this, if you wanted to really preserve all the information is you could concatenate the input vector again. But then what happens is each of your layers get wider and wider and wider. Yeah. They need more compute resources. You can't do it in parallel as easily anymore. So, you know, it turns out that this is enough. And given that it's enough, we, we probably won't do the other things. Incredible. This is actually like, this is actually one of the problems as well. It's difficult and not necessarily rewarding to experiment with little architecture tricks. So there's this, there's this paper, which was out a while ago called the bitter lesson, which basically said that like, listen, all this time we've been spending on like fancy architectures and trying to get them to encode things that we as humans know about. No, I don't know. It doesn't matter. Make it simple, feed it a lot of data. That's what matters. And so that's, that's one of the reasons why like the simple, if the simple thing works, we just, we just let it work. Did that paper come before or after 
this paper because I know like one of the things that I hear is like someone who doesn't you know spend my days reading this is like whoa the amazing thing here is that you can just feed it all this data and emergent things start happening so is that like built on top of transformers it was that like a separate thing just about architecture it after, generally it came after it came after I just looked it up it came in 2019 this is paper is from 2017 there's you know for a long it's like two cards right there's a group of researchers who say like data and scale is all you need although you know, we're, we're starting to run into the limits of that. And there's another group of people who are like, no, we need to like put more information that we know about the world into these models to get them to do more useful things. And the bitter lesson was like a publication in favor of the idea that all you need is data and scale. And so we do simple things and, and it'll just work. Which came anyway, for you um, and just so we can piss off half of the people who are watching. Yeah, you're gonna, you're definitely gonna, people are gonna come after me if I give my opinion, which I don't mind actually. So I'm, I'm in the camp that there's this other great thing called the chinchilla scaling laws. We won't go into them here, but I think that would actually be a really interesting one for our next episode, which yeah. we might go into. I've seen chinchilla um, around, so I would love to learn more. Yeah, I mean, chinchilla is basically an optimally trained large model, in optimal in certain ways. And so the chinchilla scaling laws say, like, here's the returns to more data. They, like, wrote an equation down and says, like, if you do more data, this is how much more parameters you need in your model, like how many more weights you need in your model to actually get any use out of it. Otherwise, it's worthless. Like the compute isn't worth the time. And what that what that says is like, if you go one step further and you like compute how much data we actually have, like an internet scale, we're pretty close to saturating already. So I think we're going to have to get like clever. But I've changed my opinion on a bunch of things to do with AI over the course of the year. And one of them is like the power of like text modeling. Actually, like what what actually gives you. And so, yeah, I think that's an interesting conversation to have. I I, I lean more like. We'll have to get clever. We're, like transformers are not the end, basically, is what I believe. Transformers with more data are not the end. And that word that you said, like emergent, I think that that's a really tricky word. I think emergent, I think, just means surprising in a lot of cases. Like I'm sure we'll find surprising things, and we're, we continue to find surprising things about GPT and other large models. So I'm ready to be surprised. But the thing that emergent also implicitly often means is like, we're going to just feed it more data and it'll grow new capabilities it didn't already have when it had when it had a little bit less data. I don't believe that, but I do believe that it will continue to do surprising things we haven't discovered yet. God, that's that's um, interesting. And, and maybe it's after, let's just like put a pin in that piece because I want to talk about yeah. it at the end because I think in that Andre Karpathy podcast, he was like, yeah, I think Transformers, we can ride these things for a very long time and they'll do a bunch more. And it sounds like maybe you think that new architectures are needed. So we should keep explaining I think we this haven't architecture. Exhausted them. Yeah, I think we haven't exhausted them for sure. Like, like I said, like they have capabilities. We just keep finding out more capabilities they have. Like the the, the sequential reasoning thing was like mind blowing. When you just ask it to like reason step by step, it, it it works better. And then like there's a recent paper which which is like large language models can self improve, which is like when you ask it to be critical of its own output, it performs better. <laughs> <laughs> it's wild, right? And it's already in there without any extra data. It, like it just already does it. That's um, amazing. Would it do a good job criticizing my work? Like, it, will it do better criticizing what I put in than creating something new itself? I don't know. Give it a shot. See how you feel. Cool. You've got cool. you've got like open AI credits, right? Yeah, I do. They just give those to you. Yeah. <laughs> I, and and I, um, I I started paying, but I my bill for the last two weeks I think was eighty two cents. So okay, great. Uh, it's worthwhile. We got it. Yeah. Yeah, like, so play with it. Anyway, back, back to this guy, right? So we're up to the blue box there, the feed forward piece. Feed forward here is actually the closest thing to like the classical neural network in this entire architecture. So it's it's basically a bunch of little guys called neurons, which have that nonlinear, what's called an activation function inside of them. And they've got, you know, they take the stuff that comes out of that, that previous piece, the add a norm, and then they multiply each element by the weights and then apply a nonlinearity to that to that at the end. So you, you just get new numbers out. You need this, we know we need this nonlinearity basically. And then again to make sure that like we preserve information before we apply that nonlinearity, we've got this like connection that goes around and then adds in adds in and, and norms it again. So that's yeah. one layer. That's one la so that everything in that gray box is one layer of the of the encoder. It's got six of those. In, in the reference architecture. It's got six of those. And I, again, the, like it sounds complex, but if you've been in the field for a while, this is actually surprisingly simple. 
this is this is like relatively simple which is one of the marvels of why it works so great like generally speaking ml people and i don't know technical people in general are looking for simple things that work surprisingly well rather than like elegantly constructed complex things at least that's my aesthetic preference and yeah. transformers are, are like one of those things because this is why the all you need is important in the in the paper title it's like this simple thing is actually totally enough. You don't need to do all this other fancy stuff you've been trying to build on top of it. This is this is fine. Um, I, I love the I love the title. It's not what I expect yeah. when I read a, a research paper. Attention is all you need. It's like a more of a not boring post headline. It's it's catchy. I'm gonna give you another paper. The there's a paper in computer vision called YOLO, which is already great, right? It stands for you only look once. But the, the like the paper is written by an absolute madman. And I think you'd get a kick out of just like reading it because it's, yeah. you know, it, it, it's, we'll, we'll get to that. But yeah, this, this one is actually really formally written, but has a great title. Sometimes people get a little too clever with their titles and it's like a little bit cringe, but this, this one is, this one is like good. Yeah. It's a steady anyway, power. Yeah. Six layers, six of these guys. So basically it like takes the output of the previous layer, does all that computation and then outputs it. So here's, here's how we start getting to the decoder side. So each of those output layers feeds into this decoder layer. So we're going to, and, and this is what's called order regressive. So what a transformer does is all it ever does is predict the next token, or it gives you actually what it does is actually, it gives you a distribution over the likelihood of the next token. It says, you know, this is a probability that it's like this, uh, and you can select like the, the most probable one and then feed it back in, for example. Right. So what it, what it means by order regressive is it takes the input and then it takes its own output sequentially and then uses that to make the next prediction that's what that's what's meant by order regressive and when you say it's a, a distribution does like does it keep any of like the closer like the not the most probable but the other ones like in me short-term memory or something to say like Inclusive. actually we got four words down and the other one was right oh you mean like can it can it like branch and go back can it go back and be like actually now that we've like gone further down this path like uh, no the second so most probable was right no, not in this, not in this architecture, but what you can do, of course, is like, just select the top K and have it like, keep predicting off of, off of those ones oh, uh, yeah. and see if you get, if, see if you get somewhere different. And so when you see like, I don't know, GPT or like, I don't know if you use Copilot at all, but when it makes like multiple predictions, that's what it's doing. It's like selecting, it. selecting lower down the probability tree and then making more predictions off of, off of that token. But this cool. is order regressive. So for simplicity's purpose, we're going to say like, it's going to take the most likely prediction next. Now you'll notice that this, this also looks a lot like the input. It's got the position encoding. So it has to remember like where in the output string it actually predicted the thing that it's doing. And so when it makes the first prediction, it's got like one token and then basically nothing. And then when it makes the next prediction, it like shifts that one spot to the right. So it keeps the position encoding and like predicts the next one. So it's like, oh, if this, if this one was in the first position, then what is my prediction for the second position? It keeps, it keeps that position encoding. Yeah. And this, and it f feeds it back, feeds it back in. So you see at the top here, it says output probabilities. Yep. Yeah. So from those output probabilities, which is the distribution that I mentioned, it selects like the K most probable or the most probable one to make its next prediction. It gets fed into this outputs input at the bottom in the decoder. So anyway, this is the decoder stack. So you'll Wait, notice that. Sorry. One more, one more question on, on mm -hmm. the, the position, which is. Like when it gets to the end of a sentence and adds a period, mm -hmm. it's just like, does it have any concept of a sentence? You said yeah. on the other side that it like breaks down paragraphs or sentences. Yes. Like it, how does it know where it's getting to the end of like a cohesive thing? Yeah. So there's a special character called end of text, which, which it encodes as if it was a word, right? It's like, a, it's literally like a special number representing end of text. And so when you write a prompt, you are implicitly putting end of text at the end. You're implicitly putting that character at the end. And it predicts those characters just like any other ones, right? And it's just like, okay, whoever's reading the output, like the program reading the output of the transformer sees end of text is like, okay, stop. So like, don't, yeah. don't run anymore, just stop. Yeah. And I think, I think in general that like, once it sees end of text in its output, what's called its output context, it will just only keep predicting end of text. Like it will very heavily attend to seeing end of text. Got it. Yeah. Yeah, the position encoding is just about like what place you're in, not if you've ended the sentence or not. Cool. Makes sense. Yeah. Yeah. So again, taking a look here on the right. So there's, you'll see that a lot of this is very, very similar. 
You've got the position encoding, like you mentioned. You've got multi-headed attention. The thing about this is it's masked. So what masked means is don't pay attention to stuff that is in the future. Because like hmm. it still applies attention. Like so, you know, say you have 2056 tokens in your input and output, it still can pay attention to like all that white space, but you don't want it to. So you mask it out. You only want it to like pay attention to the stuff that it's already predicted, not like garbage. So you, you mask that out when you when you yeah. And, and then all again, the, is all the white space just like a, a a number itself? Is it like already a token, it's but it's like an empty token? So the white space, it's like the way that that gets treated varies, basically. But you can think of like the white space is like padded with however many extra tokens you need to fill Got out the, the total amount. So if you have like one prediction and 2,056 total tokens in your context, you have 2,055, like whatever the white space token is. Yeah, so mask it just means like don't look at anything that is in like the empty part of the stuff you haven't predicted yet. Leave that alone. And so that mask gets like rolled back as you predict more stuff. And then again, there's this bypass, the added norm. And then again, there's this bypass to the next multi-headed attention. So this this is this is different from the encoder layer. There's this extra multi-headed attention and added norm thing, right? So what what that's doing is basically taking input from the encoder layer, the corresponding encoder layer. So if this first encoder layer goes into the first encoder layer, information is flowing now from the encoder side to the decoder side. And this multi-headed attention layer in the decoder is looking at like what stuff that I'm getting now from th this stage in the encoder, what stuff is like actually relevant given what I've already seen in my output. So it's, huh. it's now like paying attention to a lot of different stuff. It's getting a lot of different information from a lot of different parts of the context. And it's learning at each step, what parts of the context do I need to be paying attention to given what I've already predicted is another way of thinking about this. And then, yeah, you, you can see that from here, it's, it's pretty much the same thing. You've got the feed forward layer, which I described before with the skip thing. And then you add a norm to like, again, preserve that information, let as much pro information propagate as late as possible. And then once you've done that, so once you've, once you've done this like stack, you've got output finally. And the output is a linear layer, which is just like a, a set of weights where it multiplies every element of the vector by, by some number. And then you have softmax and softmax is basically just like, choose the highest probability. And that gives you the output probabilities. Yeah. It's like, just, just turn that number that's coming out of the linear layer into probabilities and then you, you, you output some probabilities and then you, you select them. The probabilities are like, for every token that I know about, every token in my vocabulary, which is like everything that's in my training data is, is all tokenized. And then there's like a giant thing. What is the probability that the next token could be that token? It huh. constructs a probability distribution over that. So it does that um, for, there's, I don't know how many words there are in the English language times, that many languages, whatever. There's that many tokens that each- yes. For each one, it's running the full distribution on all of them. Yeah, it's basically saying like, you know, find find the likelihood of whatever the next token is. And the thing is, is we can compute that efficiently. That's entirely parallelizable because where you can imagine it as like, if I want the probability for a given token, that's completely independent at this step from the probability for another token. So I can run it completely in parallel. It's it's just like I can have a lot of those, sure, but I have a lot of GPUs, so it's it's fine. Or even a single GPU can like do a lot of operations like this linear and softmax all at once. So fascinating. Yeah. A question, something that I've noticed as I've played more with GPT-3 and I wonder if it, it just illuminates anything about the model and the architecture it, itself is that it will come and it, like it structures a lot of paragraphs. Like if, it, if I'm asking for an essay in a very similar way, and then it also ends the arguments in a very similar way. And a lot of it's like, uh, probably because humans love to talk about how important whatever they've done is, but like a lot of times it'll be like, and so therefore this thing is really important because of this. And like that, that ends up happening a lot more than I would have expected. So two things that one, it ending itself calling the thing important, but then mm -hmm. two is just like, it'll say, and a blah, blah, blah does this because of blah, blah, blah. And a blah, blah, blah does this because of, blah, and it's like very repetitive. Is, mm -hmm. is there like a reason for that, that the, that yeah. the describe, explain by this? Are you, are you playing with the noise parameter at all? 
in when you're playing with your computer screen playground. Yeah, play around a little bit with the noise parameter. So the noise parameter is basically like adding a little bit of randomness about which token actually gets predicted. So like I said, there's a probability distribution, right? There's, it doesn't have to predict the most likely one. It can like roll the dice in proportion to what the probabilities are to a greater or lesser extent. Um, and decide, no, actually, I'm going to predict, like, I, I know this is the most likely one, but I actually rolled the dice and got this other one. So we're going to stick that in and see where I go, right? Yeah. So if you play with and the so noise you, parameters. Like, max out the noise, does it do that for, like, each word? It gets weird. <laughs> yeah. It's pretty weird. It gets sidetracked really easily if you do that. Like, it starts talking about, like, other stuff. It's pretty fun. Like, you, you can get it to be pretty unhinged sometimes, which I really enjoy. Yeah. I like, I like taunting the AI which is why they're going to come for me first. But... I was going to say, yeah, you're in trouble. Yeah, I mean, like, I'm definitely the guy who, like, kicks the Boston Dynamics dog because I want to see if it can stand up. <laughs> you're in real trouble then, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but yeah, like, so it, it, it will settle into common patterns, and that is a result of both the training process and the training data. So there's actually a bunch of different ways to train transformers, right? I think the way that GPT is trained, if I remember correctly, it's trained exclusively on completions, which means... It sees, sees an input, and then it's given part of the output, and then it's expected to like predict the rest of the output, and that's how you compute the loss. And then you like move that piece of text all, like further and further to the right, so it you know, has to predict it no matter where you are in the text, right? Mm -hmm. But there's a bunch of other ways to do it. People are playing with these now. They've played with them before with like big models like BERT or POM, where it's like, okay, well, I'm going to like randomly delete words and see if, if you do a good job of filling them in, or I'm going to like delete contiguous pieces in the middle instead and see how you do with that. And there's other things like fine tuning, like instruct GPT. So fine, fine tuning is like a really common thing. It's really important. It's one of the things, one of the things Chroma helps with, with large models is like, this is a great general model for like all human text, right? But that means it's not particularly good at any specific task. So if you have something like instruct GPT, where it's like you tell GPT what you want and it does it, that's a specific subset of all like language and all like text. And so you fine tune your model to like behave more in that particular way hmm. by basically showing it more of the stuff that you want. But yeah, like you, you can do that in what's called a zero shot fashion, which is when you like prompt engineering is like also called zero shot, zero shot fine tuning, where you like say, write this in my voice or write this like Elon Musk would write it. That's like fine tuning because you're like asking it to only like, no, don't just write this essay, write it like Elon Musk would write this essay. Yeah. Um, so that's like zero shot fine tuning, but there's other things you can do which are more like a traditional training process to fine tune the model. And that will constrain it in, in the things that it outputs. The other thing to remember is a lot of the time there is content moderation going on behind the scenes where it's already been fine tuned or trained in a particular way. So as to avoid like unhappy types of output that, that like, OpenAI or other companies might not really want their models to do. Yeah, that that seems yeah. that seems fair. So when I'm telling it to to write like Elon Musk, mm -hmm. I guess it's another good like just thing to dig on in on to understand what's happening better. Is it all happening like in this architecture yep. here, or is it like something in the background? In really? So it's not just saying it like all all right, here. we're just going to look at any Elon stuff. So, like, so what's yes it? and yes and no. Oh. So that's the thing about attention, right? So it's like it will attend to the fact that you said like Elon Musk and that will weight its predictions. Like it'll go through this entire stack that we described and it will be like, okay, like in some ways I'm going to change now my probabilities of completion. Cause you asked me, cause like I'm attending to the fact that you said like Elon Musk and that's different to And like this, the, the other thing that, that used to happen with the first version of GPT-3, you would like ask it to do something, but it would just describe the thing. It wouldn't actually do it. Like you could say, right, right blah, 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 and it would just describe the thing that you asked for and wouldn't actually do it. But with Instruct GPT, it, it like, it's much better at actually doing the task. And that's because Instruct GPT is fine-tuned to basically attend to what you're asking it to do more than like the thing, the thing itself, the, the, like, the subject. And again, that's a gross simplification people are going to yell at me for, but again, I don't care. <laughs> <laughs> and so if I... I guess like the last one on this particular point, but if I sure. brought my own model, right? I said like, here's, I, mm -hmm. I'm going to dump in like all of my journal entries that I've written and uh, mm -hmm. you know mm -hmm. all the mm -hmm. private stuff on my computer and whatever, and I'm going to marry it with this big, like what's, what happens 
there? Does, yeah. does my stuff just get dumped in and like it knows that it's mine and so it waits? Uh, what happens? Yeah, so that's like that's a good description of a way to do fine tuning. You can like freeze most of the model and then retrain some parts of it to like be more responsive to package type writing. Or you can do another thing, which is you stick a classifier on the end of this and you make it make tons and tons of predictions and then you filter out only the ones that are like you. Huh. That's another way to do it. One thing that, that that's like really cool about transformer models is they, at least for English, one of the big problems right now is like, we haven't really trained them well enough on other, on other languages. It's like a big deal, except for the, the translation tasks. So we don't really know some of their limitations as well in other languages. Like we like, like, okay, great English tasks, but like, is this equally good if the whole thing is running in German or in Chinese? We don't know. One of the big open questions right now is like, how do we evaluate how good these models actually are? We're kind of saturating all of our benchmarks right now. We don't know if it's good or not. And then people come along and like demonstrate some tasks that they're absolutely horrible at, which means that we've got bad evaluations right now. Like, Huh. And the other thing is, is like, because these models are text and it's about humans interacting with the text as opposed to interacting, like as opposed to the model interacting with the real world, humans will fill in the gaps. You will let the model get away with nonsense that you might not even notice. Cause like when, you, when you're talking to another person, right? Like if they have, if they have small flaws in their speech or they're like, you know, they didn't quite express themselves clearly, you can like tell what they're getting at. Yeah. We're, we're like designed as humans to error correct. Right. So we, we're very lenient towards the model as well. We're like, oh, no, I, I get what it's saying. It's OK. And when you like you like sit down and, and think through it critically and analytically, it's almost gibberish sometimes. Yeah, that, that was a big digression, but I think it's important. Yeah, but it's the same that. with, I guess, fortune tellers, too, or whatever, where you're like, yeah. oh, my God, that is exactly, you know, like yeah, I, I am going to marry the person that I love. And so you're like looking for reasons for the, yeah. that it's right. Yeah, like the, it's, it's the Barnum effect. Right. It's like you tell people what they want to hear and then they, they don't really care if it's right or not. Yeah. 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 Anyway, so we're learning more about ourselves through this whole process. Actually, I think that's one of the most fascinating things about about this whole thing. Like we are going to learn a lot more about how people actually think by building these things and then have people interact with them because they're pretty good mimics at this point. Yeah. Um, and I think that's actually really, really interesting. I think we're going to learn more about like what intelligence actually is or see, the, I hate that because intelligence is this fuzzy word. I think more of what's going to happen is like, we're going to nail down what we mean by intelligence a little bit more over time, hopefully by, by like playing with these things. Anyway. Yeah. Like fine tuning, fine tuning on like packing output is, can be done in a, in a bunch of different ways is the, is the short version to the question you actually asked. Fair. So on training, I mean, like this is another one of those, like, very big, dumb, general questions, and you've addressed a sure. little bit of it before, but we hear about model training all of the time and training data and like all of this, mm -hmm. like high level, and, and maybe we'll, we'll structure this the same way as before. Like what is training? Like when you're talking about training a model, what are you doing? And how do you change with transformers? Yeah, that's a, that, those are really good questions. So again, training a model is just updating the model's weights based on the difference between what it predicted and what you wanted it to, to predict, like based on what it output and what you wanted it to output. I think one of the things that's like hard for me to grasp on is like, is this a human going in and I mean, like not adjusting. No. So what no, is, no, what's the is human doing? The and then like, what's, yeah. The, the human, like the human basically selects the data one way or another. He selects the data for the model, selects the model architecture. So like, says I, I'm going to make a I'm going to train a transformer and I'm going to train it on like here the WMT 2014 English German data set. That's what the human does, and then feeds it into a program, and the program trains the model. And what the program does is it basically looks, like I said, it looks at the output of the model, compares it to the desired output, computes a number. It's called a loss, and then it computes the derivative of that number with respect to changing the weights and then it changes the weights in the right direction. It's looking for, it's looking for like an optimal set of weights that will give the best possible prediction given the training, given the, like the input data. It's, that's what it's basically doing. And there's a lot of, a lot of subtlety and a lot of different ways in setting that up, but that's the basic idea. Yeah. Compute the difference between what you want to know, what you got, then compute a gradient, which is basically like the direction and amount to change each weight in your model by, and then apply that change and then do it again. And then just keep doing it until you're getting sick of it, basically. And does a human yeah. do anything at this point? Or do you say like, ah, that output is not what I 
wanted the loss is too high. Here's here's more or different data because I need to like do something different here. Or is the human like done once you've fed the, the initial steps in? So I'm glad you brought that up because Chroma does exactly that part. They select what data is optimal for the task that you want your model to perform or the, the things you actually want it to do. It, we, we help the human figure out what data is actually needed next time around or to fine tune your model or in the case of large models, it's mostly about fine tuning or preparing data sets or, in, or integrating new sources of data. But during the training process itself, most of what you do is sitting, is sit there and watch your graphs and, and make sure it's not doing anything catastrophic. And you probably want to be paying attention to like, so when you're training these very, very large models, one interesting thing that happens is you have so many GPUs running for so long that like failure rates on their components are actually significant. Like your, your, your average like person who owns like a gaming box, 3090 Ti, if they're lucky in it, they'll never see that GPU fail over the lifetime of the GPU. If you're training GPT-3, like you have thousands, order thousands of GPUs running constantly. You will see failures. So one of the things you have to do is like make this training loop robust to those. Because you, like imagine, imagine you've like almost finished, 99% done, and one of your GPUs, GPUs just burns out. You're like you don't want to start again, right? So there's a lot of subtlety and there's a lot of engineering that goes into optimizing and making that process robust for these large models. But again, it's it's automatic. It's so much data that it's in, like it's physically impossible for humans to go look at it. Yeah. all of it. it we, we, like, we just can't. If you like sat down thousands of people for, you know, probably years, you probably wouldn't get to see everything in the data set. I actually probably should do that napkin map. I'd be curious. I'd be curious about how many people we would need to look through the entire GPT-3 training set in a year. Like how many people would we need to do that? Uh, oh, I should yeah. sit down and figure that Maybe out. Maybe everybody. I think that'd be fun. <laughs> it's probably like what humanity everybody. would be doing for might... yeah. We may need to increase the population, but yeah. Wild. Yeah. I guess anyway. two, two small things there. So mm -hmm. the one that we didn't pick up is before and after. And then two, I know this is a basic one, but what GPUs are and why mm -hmm. GPUs instead of CPUs for, yep. for machine learning? Great, great. Yeah, that's, those are really good questions. So a GPU is like nominally a graphics processing unit. This year, you know, if, if you're my age, you used to call them video cards. Yep. Yeah. Like... What these guys can do is lot, tons and tons and tons of basically multiplications and additions in parallel, very, very fast. That's, that's all they do. And it turns out like they were invented for like 3D accelerating games because most of like 3D graphics is about multiplying and adding stuff together. It's these, exactly those matrix multiplications times vectors of numbers that we talked about. Turns out super useful for machine learning. Like NVIDIA got really, really lucky with that. Like yeah. imagine if machine learning needed something else, they'd be like... But nope, turns out it's exactly right. So it's actually kind of interesting. One of the first uses for GPUs outside of like gaming was actually with like the hedge fund people because they needed like massively parallel streams of data, like processed as fast as possible. Yeah. So they like coded, like they used to, it used to be called shaders, they're called kernels now. Like they coded these little programs that run inside the GPU, but not to like draw polygons. They just like made them compute whatever their models for the hedge funds. And then that leaked into like AI where we realized that, well, what we're really doing here is tons of matrix multiplications and then applying some function and then doing an addition. GPUs are great for that. They can do it like massively parallel. So your CPU might have, I don't know, eight cores, right? GPU, hundreds of cores, thousands of cores yeah. on the big ones. Um, all doing like additions and matrix multiplications in parallel because a lot of the stuff that this thing does is completely parallelizable, right? And so another thing, and we spoke about this at the start, but Another thing that transformer architecture does better than those recurrent network architectures is utilize more of the GPU for more of the time. It's, it's possible to push more and more computations through it, which means that generally speaking, as a rule of thumb, you can train on larger amounts of data more efficiently. And the idea is, is that having more data is, 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 is better for performance. And are we getting to like the, the limits of that at this point here, or do the GPU still have juice to, to squeeze? No, I think, so I think our limit actually is not compute. I think that like, you know, people say, oh, GPT, it's so expensive to train. It costs $6 million. $6 million is nothing. For, yeah. for a capability, for a capability like this, like you and I both know people with $6 million in their couch cushions. So like, it's, it's just not a large amount of money. So we're not really compute limited. It's, I think we're starting to saturate on data. I think a lot of people would agree that we're starting to saturate on text data. And I, I think that's actually a really good topic for next one. I want to talk about the chinchilla scaling laws because I think they are the first things that we have 
that speak at least something to the possible limitations of, of, of doing things the way that we're doing. And, and, and we'll see. Amazing. Yeah. All right. Yeah. So that's a, a very good teaser. Yeah. Let's do it. Is there anything that we haven't hit? The rest is, is really just kind of results and, and conclusion results. Yeah. It worked really, um, really well. Outperformed previous models. Yeah. So like I, it's really fun to talk about this. And again, the paper's really information dense. It's really interesting. Highly recommend reading it. If you don't have like an especially technical background, my friend Ahmad built this thing to explain paper. I think you've been using it as well. Yes. It's um, awesome. Has it, has it helped you? It, I mean, I, that's how I read, that's how I read through, through this paper the first time. And there's spots where it was like pr fairly like mathematical sentences that I highlighted. And so for those of you watching the way that explain paper works is you have the paper. I think they started with just a few when I first tried it. Now you can put in any arbitrary paper. They started, this we'll, pa they started with this paper. This it one. started with this paper, which is it, <laughs> yeah. you know, the, the foundation again. And you can highlight the different sections in it. It'll explain what's going on in plain English. And by plain English, I don't mean like, you know, something also complicated. It'll be like, this is in a quick sentence, kind of what's happening in a way that you can understand yeah. and like occasionally why that's important. It, it was like shocking to me how good the explanations were and then you can ask it kind of further questions of the text yeah. so explain paper highly recommend it's just explainpaper.com right yeah explainpaper.com we should we should put that up on the screen for sure yeah but it's super cool i'm actually using it as well even as somebody who has like technical depth in this i find it really helpful and the way that i find it helpful is like understanding why the thing the author is saying is important and linking it back to like other things like how does this link into the like the broad web that's 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 what i've been finding useful for yeah. Yeah. It made me, awesome. it made me really want that for like the whole internet. Yeah. I mean, like kind of, that's what genius was going to be. Right. Yeah. Um, I've always, I've wanted genius back forever. Yeah. Like a good version um, of genius. Yeah. So, so, so maybe for the whole web, I think actually just starting with scientific papers is, is a great spot to start. I was like explaining to Oman how this is important to the future of humanity the other day to like get him hyped up. But I honestly, like, I think this is, this is a really step forward. So people should check that out if they want to like, read this paper, but don't necessarily have all the technical depth to understand everything right away. Cool. And I guess in closing, mm -hmm. and maybe we'll just make this a part of it. If you had to explain in two sentences, why attention is all you need was so important. Like what should a dumbass like me take away when you like the first thing that you think when you hear attention is all you need should be X. Right. So it's a really simple model that gives great performance on a traditionally difficult task. And it's also faster and in some sense more compute and data optimal than anything that came before it. And it's the foundation for so many things that have come since like transformers, which this paper more or less introduced are the foundation for so many of today's like large models. And I think that that's why this is important. Beautiful. Well, this was more fun than I even thought it was going to be. I think we'll be back next week to talk about chinchillas. So this is going yeah, to be a lot it. of fun. I'll, I'll read up. Is there, is there a paper that if people want to like, just kind of read in the interim, is there like the paper that they should read on yes. chinchillas? And yes. what's that called? Let me put it in the show notes. Let me find it. It's, it's like, I always forget training compute optimal large language models. Here it is. This is, this is a really good paper to follow up this one with. And the reason is because when Transformers dropped, everyone was like, okay, we're just going to make the largest possible model. We're going to put billions of parameters. We're going to just train it as large as we can go. And then the Chinchilla scaling laws show that like, well, a lot of that is wasted effort and here's exactly why. So. Awesome. All right. Well, I'll read up. I'm just going to dump this and explain paper, have it explain the paper to me, and then we'll do the human version next week. Sounds great. All right, Packy, this is a lot of fun. This is fun. Bye. Talk later. Bye-bye.